Hello, and welcome to Wild Sound Civilized, your monthly podcast about music, literature, and everything betwixt. Bailey Duff. And today we're talking about Spring Awakening, the musical and not the original novel. Play. Crap. Oh, <laughs> I'm already messing up. We're keeping that in. I don't care. Okay. Okay. The musical that is not the play that is about teens and the things that teens don't do and then do and then implode. So the long story long is that you have Vendla. A young lady whose mom will not tell her where babies come from. And you have Melchior, a young man who happens to know where babies come from because he has read it in books, which I don't know how well that translates. (laughs) And we will talk about that. But they have um, some other assorted teens and they're all friends. They're all growing up in 18th century Germany, just not knowing about... It's 19th century. Is it? Oh, it's, it is 19. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. I did 1800s and 19s in my head in a funny way, which is a common mistake. All of them are going through a sexual frustration. None of them actually know what it is, except for Melchior, who tells all his friends what it is in the form of an essay, which I love. <laughs> I, I wish we could see that essay. <laughs> I really, really desperately want friends that say, I don't understand this. Will you provide me with an essay? <laughs> Because that's one of the things that I really miss in my life. I need a good essay. Oh, those were always my favorite. Or in-class essays, Mm -hmm. exam essays. Mm -hmm. When you don't know what it's going to be about and you get to the end of the exam, they're like, you can do a biographical essay on Mozart or Beethoven or Tchaikovsky. And you're like, all right, okay, what if I do all three? (laughs) Not that I've been there, but yes, I have. So then they find out about sex. And then some of them have sex, particularly Melchior and Vendla. And Vendla is pregnant. Melchior's life, he gets sent away to another school. He doesn't know what's going on. And he doesn't realize that Vendla is pregnant. And he comes back to town to find her grave. And that is plot A. And plot B is Melchior's friend Moritz, who asks him for the essay, is hoping to pass in school so that he can move on and do bigger, better things. And he doesn't through some terrible bureaucracy of the education system. As a result, his life implodes and he eventually commits suicide. And at the very end, when Melchior is like, oh no, the ghost of Vendla and Moritz pop up and say, do better. And that's the whole thing. Yeah. Also, there's music. The look on Bailey's face right now, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, full disclosure, I usually don't like musicals. And fuller disclosure, I actively dislike musicals most of the time. And fullest disclosure, I did not enjoy this work, not because it's not good, but because it is so far from being my cup of tea, it felt like dishwater. It's fair. It's a fair There we go. Just full honesty here. I really enjoy this musical. I think because of my interest in young adult literature and contemporary young adult literature and what we deem appropriate for children, what information we give them access to, looking at a play that was written and performed in 1891 about teens having sex, um, being translated to a musical in 2007 with the same issues being relevant. I find that really interesting. I do too. I find that interesting. I enjoyed the plot. I enjoyed reading the libretto. I listened to the soundtrack twice, and the first time was painful. And the second time, I felt dead inside. (laughs) And I'm being hyperbolic a little bit, but this is so far from my wheelhouse. And like, I say that as if I'm not aware of it. I'm aware of musicals. I have listened to musicals. I have performed in musicals. I have played in the pit for musicals. I have written a children's musical based on an opera. I am not unaware of the conventions. They just tend to chafe. I don't know. It's it's like being forced 
to do something you dislike enough times that you dislike it more. Mm. It's mainly the musical style. This was sold to me, and I'm not pointing fingers or naming names, Emily, <laughs> as a rock musical. And that is not not what I heard. No? It's no. like pop rock. It is pop. It? it is pop. You were expecting more like Led Zeppelin opposed to like... No, no, no. I was expecting a healthy dose of emo. I oh. grew up in the early 2000s. I was there. As, as were, <laughs> we're you. We're the same age. I know. <laughs> and I can roll with a good bit of emo. I have seen My Chemical Romance live. It was glorious. I can get into that mood. I can be there. Yes, indeed. Panic of the Disco, here I am. <laughs> but it wasn't even the kind of rock that resonated with youth at the time. Like, if you're talking about this being contemporary and also historical and the application of those themes, where was the contemporary culture? It didn't seem to be there. It just seemed like the most bland, softened, gentle pop punk that ever graced K-Light FM with a healthy dose of dramatic nasal musical singing. I can deal with nasal singing in certain contexts, I went through a Billy Talent phase, as every Canadian in their 20s has. When you have to listen to multiple singers <laughs> put on this, I don't want to call it an accent, but this affectation, <laughs> this style of singing, particularly the version that I listened to, Melchior's voice. Were you listening to the original Broadway? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. And it's not that I didn't enjoy the songwriting, it's clearly well written in a style that I don't enjoy in many ways. Like, it's not just the style of the music, it's the style of the way musical songs are composed. If you listen to a pop tune, you're a lot more likely to come up with this standard song structure. You have a verse, you have a chorus, you have a verse, you have a chorus, you have a bridge, you have a chorus. And a lot of the songs here follow that convention too, but in a musical, you're far more likely to come upon something that's through composed something that builds throughout and doesn't necessarily hold that structure because it's adapted from a monologue, say, like in this. You get some repetitive parts, but it's trying to take you somewhere. It's trying to go somewhere without necessarily revisiting those earlier parts, Okay, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I love a good bit of leader. Like Schubert did this, where it would be through composed, there wouldn't be any repetitive parts, and it would just take you somewhere. But there's something about a pop song that's not composed as a pop song, that's sung as a pop song, that's trying to be a rock song, but is also trying to be so earnest and just forthright with its emotions in a way that no actual artist would be self-aware. It just, it feels really off. I think that's what it comes down to. When I listen to musicals, it feels incredibly inauthentic. Especially because they sing out of nowhere. Why are they singing? What are they singing for? This isn't an <laughs> opera. They haven't been singing the whole time. We are not in the heightened reality of the ring cycle. We are like living out our normal life, being repressed teens, trying to figure out junk. And now we're singing. I what? <laughs> I'm sorry. I had too much caffeine today. I was hoping that you wouldn't hate this as much as other musicals because like, it isn't adapted monologue so it's not like they're singing out of nowhere it's within the stage convention of like you take the step aside you step out of the action mm -hmm. and then you deliver this thing that happens to be in song i was hoping that wouldn't be no the convention itself is one of the things i dislike okay like a monologue even uh, i don't know a monologue makes more sense to me when you're stepping offside and you're hearing somebody's inner thoughts but a monologue that's a song it does a couple of things that i don't like one it halts the progress of the plot so that you can ruminate in things that should already be clear if it's well written. Mm. And the other thing is that the music is never good. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know how else to phrase that. <laughs> but like, I don't enjoy the style of it in the same way that I don't enjoy most country music. It's not that it isn't worked on and thought through and composed and designed to be enjoyed. It's that there is something within me <laughs> that is broken <laughs> that refuses to accept the musical. And there are musicals that I do like. Cabaret, the best musical of all time. I do like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. 
because it is ridiculous and it's mm-hmm. meant to be ridiculous and jarring and that helps. What else do I like? I like Disney movies, but they have their own conventions. Right. I would not necessarily refer to them as musicals, and maybe that's a mistake on my part. I'm just, I'm trying to tease out why I dislike them so much. (laughs) So that you can talk about why you like them, and we can figure out what's at the root of this. Is it the break from reality? It might be. I think that's a big part of it. And for the record, I really enjoy opera, which you would know because episode two is about an opera. I like opera. And part of the reason that I think it's easier for me to accept opera is the style, but also the fact that for most of them, you're singing all the way through. It's not like a, I'm doing this, and no, I'm doing this. It's like a, I'm doing this the whole time, guys. It makes it normal within the context of the work, Mm. and it also makes it feel like the work is elevated. It makes the work feel more epic and legendary and exciting and meaningful to hear it musically all the way through. And this is the argument, I don't know if you've come across this argument anywhere online, that Hamilton is an opera because it is sung all the way through. I don't want to get into that. (laughs) We'll save that for another time. But I have heard some very compelling points on both sides to why Hamilton is a musical or why Hamilton would be an opera. It's easier for me to listen to an opera as much as I did enjoy the plot and the ideas behind this musical. This is the thing that kills me. I love the idea of talking about sexual education and repression in 1800s Germany. Awesome. Yeah, great. Let's talk about that. And the music, if anything, took me out of it. (laughs) I think that was the point, though. That was the, like, it's trying to bridge the gap. Mm -hmm. And really, I think also seeing this performed might change the experience as well. Absolutely, yeah. Part of the staging for this is that everybody is in... Uh, 19th century clothing but then when they sing they pull out handheld microphones Mm -hmm. and like dance in really jarring ways yeah so that you see them behaving like modern teens while dressed like yeah 19th century teens and sort of bridging that gap the issues haven't changed it's been a hundred plus years yep and the issues haven't changed and that's fun i like the idea of that i mean as fun as that can be (laughs) i enjoy this intellectually but not emotionally which is fair. Realize I sound like an old lady here, just yap, yap, yapping <laughs> about how mad I am. I want to talk about consent. And I think that this is the big point of this. When I was researching this, this was the part where I went, oh, we're going to talk about that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because in the original play, when Melchior and Venla do have sex, it is not consensual. It is rape. Venla becomes pregnant and dies as a result of that rape. And in the musical, it is a consensual act. But it's not informed consent. No, 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 definitely not. But it's something that I think she agrees, she to, agrees it. to it, not knowing what it is, which means he definitely has more power in that situation. I think the choice to change it is interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think it changes the implication of the work a great deal, if that is a consensual act. Although you do point out that without her being informed, it isn't really fully consensual. She doesn't doesn't know what she's consenting to, right? Because her mother has told her that the only way to get pregnant is to love your husband with all your heart. And so she's like, this guy wants to, like, touch me and kiss me. I don't love him. He's not my husband, so I can't have him. Sounds good. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Do you think that they changed that to raise that point, though? I think it speaks to some interesting conversations. So this text was published in 2007. Judith Levine in 2001 finally got someone to publish a text called Harmful to Minors. Like it took so long to get anyone to agree to publish it because of how controversial it is. Mm. I guess feminism has worked to put laws into place to keep children and women safe Mm -hmm. in terms of consent. And she's arguing in that book a sort of devil's advocate argument that kids know what they want. Whether or not you tell them the consequences of doing the actions with their bodies they're going to figure out this feels good my body can do this and i want to do this yeah it is in her opinion more harmful to shelter young people from this information Mm -hmm. yeah that's definitely the thesis of this what right does anybody have to deny someone knowledge and agency over their body (laughs) regardless of their age the parents in this 
work. It doesn't even seem to be a conscious denial. It seems to be a cultural denial. Mm -hmm. And they seem just as repressed as their kids. As much as you want to blame the parents, which I do, definitely want to blame the parents there, I think the fact that it is a larger societal issue is what should really be tackled there. Sex education is controversial. I don't fully understand why. I don't understand this shutting down of things because they're uncomfortable. Maybe I'm just morbid, but I like to pick at things when they are uncomfortable. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe we are having this podcast picking at uncomfortable things. <laughs> I definitely think that the societal issue is still at play. I think nowadays it tends to be more personal. You do have parents that deny information. You do have parents that want the culture to be the way it was 100 years ago. I don't know if you have friends that have been as sheltered as Venla, but I think I have. And it's a bit more jarring culturally now, even though we still have a way to go. I have a friend who her parents got her out of sex education in high school. And I've sort of lost touch with her, so I have no idea what her adult life is like, what that learning curve has been like. It's not something that I would like message her and be like, so how did, um... How's your sex life? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for putting that that way. Um, but then I've also encountered people who went through the same education system as I did. Like, we mm -hmm. attended sex education classes. Somehow something went wrong. <laughs> oh, no. Like, to the point that either it was taught poorly or it wasn't tested well enough. Like, somehow this friend came away understanding that the menstrual cycle meant that women were bleeding all of the time. Oh. We had the same health teacher, and somehow that is what he came away with. So there's there are some profound opportunities yeah. for misunderstanding. Well, misunderstanding is so much of education, <laughs> <laughs> is presenting information and seeing what a young mind does with it, and then gently course correcting what needs to be course corrected. That speaks to there not being course correction in terms of what his actual school was able to do. So maybe this is a situation where he doesn't feel comfortable going to someone with questions or a person of authority doesn't want questions asked. Yeah. Especially because that's uncomfortable as an educator to have a one-on-one -on -one with a student asking questions of this nature. Mm. Especially if they're in middle school, high school, it gets to kind of tricky ground in a couple of different ways. More than that, that means that his parents didn't course correct at any point. And I think that that is the difference between people that are somewhat well adjusted <laughs> with things like this and people that don't get it. But I think the elephant in the room here is the internet. Yeah. You should be able to figure it out on your own. You should. Not that that's the best way to do it. In our generation, I do think we were kind of the last generation that was raised without internet. Mm -hmm. In my mind, I think. My family got a computer with internet when I was in grade 10. Do you know when it was for you? We had internet for quite a while, but like hmm. the non-dial-up internet <laughs> was something we got when I was 10 or 11. So I did have access to hmm. a computer. Yeah. The internet wasn't the same though. No. There wasn't an internet culture. No. And there wasn't, even though there were chat rooms and there were things of that nature, I think there's a lot more anonymous communication nowadays. And I think that it's a lot easier for young people to find themselves wrapped up in communities where they're exposed to things that maybe they aren't ready to be exposed to because you can't tell somebody's age from a username. I mean, I was, what, 15, I guess, when I had internet. We did have a computer before then, but it was exclusively used for playing StarCraft. I think that the generation younger than us, they were in middle school with this internet culture around them. They were figuring these things out with these assumptions and this secondary culture to give them information, but also to give them misinformation. People our age are far more, far more likely to have had a misunderstanding like your friend. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that people younger than us are far more likely to have really warped views of intimacy based on viewing certain adult material. But the fun thing is that you cannot ask young people about their sex lives. Research being done on the effects of pornography on children is only ever done after they're 18. So it's yeah. 18, 20, whatever, young as you can get basically, okay. is people reflecting on the experience of how old was I when I first saw porn? Was I 10? I don't know how that affected me. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and I might sound 
again, like an old lady, but I don't think there's a way for that not to affect you. I think that your first experiences with sort of sexual education tend to stick with you. They tend to be the type of thing that affects you when you're much older. And I don't think it's fair to put the onus of education for anything on children. I mean, it's our job as adults, as a society. I'm speaking as a teacher, so I'm incredibly biased to find a way to give kids the information that they need. And maybe when they're six, that is not the full birds and the bees conversation. But by the time they're 12, it should make sense at that point. There shouldn't really be too many mysteries left. I mean, the mystery of actually doing it. In terms of mechanics, in terms of surprises, there should not be many. Yeah after that point. I wonder if the internet is a good resource. There are great resources. I think oh, Hannah Witten. Hannah Witten. Lindsay. It's like Ask Lindsay or something. She is a she, she, yeah, I'm fairly certain she's a doctor in... She has like short brown hair. She's yes. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. And she has a YouTube channel and it's great. Yeah. There are great resources out there. Marketing to children is very tricky. Mm. And marketing to children when there's literally the world offered to them on the internet is even harder. What kind of internet search do you think a young, inexperienced, 13-year-old trying to figure this out is going to make? That's located on the church's internet? It's, well, yeah, let's try it. <laughs> let's see what happens. Okay. So if I was a 13-year-old girl and I had no idea, I would probably search. Just in the internet in general? Yep, just in Google. What is sex? We'll see what pops up. So it defines it. Okay. It's chiefly with reference to people sexual activity including specifically sexual intercourse they enjoyed talking about sex is the example is that a dictionary definition mm -hmm. is there a wikipedia article there is but it's buried under what is sex from teenhealthsource.com introduction to sex and how to have sex from avert.org so like it looks like two fairly legitimate resources yeah come up first and then you get the wikipedia article and then underneath that is again an educational resource so i guess further to my question if you were a 13 year old girl entirely uneducated would you be looking things up to understand or would you be trying to look up titillating material probably both yeah yeah i think there's no way that someone just does one. It's tricky because you want people to have as much agency as they can, and yet I'm not a parent, but if I were to be a parent, oh, I would have parental controls all over that internet. I wouldn't. I would probably be that parent that like would be really awkward and like mm -hmm. uncomfortable, but I would want to be that parent that's like, so by the way, this is a thing. Mm -hmm. I would definitely be the parent that's buying the condoms, being like, mm -hmm. this is how you use them. I would be too. Um, and I would definitely want to have the conversation with my child or I would want them to come to me with questions before they go to pornography. And maybe this is a hard line, I don't know. I do think that it creates weird expectations for people. I'm speaking as somebody that doesn't totally get it either. I would want them to have as healthy and as positive an understanding to begin with. By the time a student, a child, is in their teens no no parental controls don't make sense at that point but i don't want my eight-year-old clicking on a link and accidentally seeing something far beyond their scope of understanding especially because that's the type of thing that causes confusion and i don't want confusion to be their first response i don't know i feel like i would never want a kid to hit any sort of wall like i would want them to have all of the access but have the relationship with that child that mm -hmm. so you find something really weird let's talk about it yeah i think that's a healthy response too i think either way you cannot protect them from everything no there it's not possible and i think that parental controls are a short-term solution but they are a tool in the toolkit yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Especially trying to imagine how to raise a kid now is crazy. Like I was saying with our generation, we didn't grow up playing iPhone games at four. We didn't grow up with YouTube kids. My coworker has teenagers and the big issue for her is Snapchat. Yeah. The pressure that her sons and their friends put on other girls. Like she basically has the type of relationship that I would want with children. She's like, hey, I can see that 
like this came in. I don't know that I would want like everything that her kids send comes to her phone, so she's viewing it. And then she's like, yeah. by the way, I saw this topless photo. Let's talk about it because it's child pornography. I don't know that I would want to be the parent. That's no, like I don't want to monitor things. And when I say I want to put controls in place, that's not me saying like, I want to know everything that goes in and out because that sounds A, exhausting and B, so invasive. So incredibly invasive, but also at some point, your only option. And that's what's terrible and terrifying about parenthood. Yeah, part of her having that much access is having the ability to start these conversations. Yeah. If you're getting sent these photos, if you're asking for these photos, mm -hmm. this is the implication. If you yep. are sending these photos, the internet is forever. Yep. And we didn't have that, or at least I didn't have that. I assume that you also didn't have no. that. That was not part of the culture when we were kids. When I was in middle school, when I was 13, I was really invested in whether I could draw dragons well. And I was just getting to the point where I felt jaded about Nancy Drew. I was a child. <laughs> and I see 13-year-old students, and more and more they behave as adults because they are immersed in this adult internet culture. And it isn't necessarily a black and white bad thing. But I think at any point where there's a huge cultural shift like that, you need to be careful. If that means open conversations, but no internet controls, they're free to figure things out and you can trust that child. But I knew myself as a kid, and I'm trying to imagine any kid that I would have, and I think they would be fairly sassy and sneaky. And I also think that when all of the kids are so educated, even if Let's pretend for a second that I want to raise my child to not know anything about sex until the day they turn 18 and then I'll tell them everything, which is terrible. Don't do that. Everybody in their class is on the internet. Yeah. Everybody knows these things. They're going to find out by the strange osmosis that is sharing a class with someone. Even if one student, I mean, in Spring Awakening, the musical we're supposedly covering right now, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to yep. get back to that. <laughs> Melchior writes this essay for his friends to be like, okay, guys, these are the deets. So this is an extremely repressed society. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nobody knows anything about sex except for this one little boy, sorry, young man who has read it in books and he still prepares an essay for all of his friends to read and they all find out about it. This dis information disseminates so quickly among young people that are trapped in schools all day. That sounds bad. That are in schools learning all day. But it seems like I want to, again, try and get back to the text. <laughs> the lyrics of the song, It's the Bitch of Living. Yep, that's what it's called. Moritz and the boys sing about how the experience of living with nothing but your hand is bitch. So they've all sort of figured out how to deal with their feelings. And clearly none of them have been given any education. Like the essay is Melchior, Melchior, yes? Melchior. Mel Melchior? Melchior, thank you. The essay is Melchior being like, hey guys, here's the science, or whatever 19th century science on sex. Females yeah. have hysteria and you must cure it. <laughs> <laughs> So he's like, I have the science, but like everybody's already figured it out anyway. Like, if I do this thing with my hand, it feels good and it makes this go away. I don't know if they've fully discovered the mysteries <laughs> of womanhood, though. No. I think that's the missing element, right? Because it's, it's an act on the self when they don't understand it. But that very quickly becomes, in this case, an act of violence. Yeah. on women around them. It's almost like not knowing what to do causes bad things to happen to women. Yep. Just a small observation. <laughs> I just, I don't know how we're going to tie this in, but I'm just looking at it and it made me laugh when I read it. Please do. So it's more, it's the horror. Melky, why, why, why am I haunted by the legs of a woman? By the deepening <laughs> conviction, some part, some dark part of my destiny may lie between there. <laughs> <laughs> true. It's all true. That's all the sex education anybody needs. Yep. That his destiny lies between the legs of women. I don't know how you felt about the characters Ernst and the other one, and their being gay. They're yeah. falling for each other. But I found it really interesting that nowhere in the descriptions of sex that the main characters sort of heard or disseminated was any sort of queer sexual experience 
included? I don't really know where Ontario's sex education is. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna sound angry about this, but I'm gonna give it like the cliff note version. So there was a sex, sex education curriculum in place. Um, I believe it was actually from around the time that this came out, from the early 2000s, I think. And our provincial government was voted in as conservative not too long ago. And one of the first things that they wanted to do was to repeal the current sex education and reinstate the sex education from, I think it was 96, I want to say, 94. There was, there was a nine in there. I do remember hearing about this. So I'm on Facebook. <laughs> and a lot of my friends are teachers. And it was all I heard about for a really long time. Because sex, sex education is health education. And by repealing it back to what it had been, you're giving the absolute bare bones to kids in middle school. And a lot of what the sex education, the later edition that included kids as young as six, seven was, was hygiene. The beginnings of conversations about consent, acceptance of people, and that's what was beginning at that sort of young age. It wasn't actual sex education until a few years later. But with this repeal, they're losing information on how to deal with menstruation when it actually comes around. You get bare bones. <laughs> <laughs> and this would have been the sex education curriculum that we did. By the time that we actually had sex education, because we're the same age, it would have been grade five, which was in 2001. Yeah. So, so we, we had the old sex education curriculum. Did we? Or yeah. would we have gotten the new one by the no. time we were in high school? I think, mm, well, we only had health class in grade nine, right? Wow. Uh-huh. When I say bare bones, what I mean is that the information is there, but that it doesn't come from maybe an organic place. If you've had a health class from the time that you're eight and your health class starts out with like, you're gonna get stinky when you turn 11 and you're gonna have to shower every day and probably wear this funky thing called deodorant. Okay, all right, I'm on board. And when you turn nine and it's sometimes people feel the same way that you do about this type of person, about a different type of person, and that's okay because people can just love each other. Cool, all right, nice, health class. You turn 10 and it starts to become, when one person feels this way and another person feels this way, they can do this, but they should make sure that they're ready. It's cumulative. Right. You cannot shoehorn in being raised in a culture that wants consent, that that puts it on a pedestal, that is never going to be equal to a couple of classes. I think I've probably had 10 health classes in my life because I think it was always a component of gym. Yeah. And it was always something that was done because it was obligatory. And it was always an afterthought. <laughs> it was like the unit they squeezed in at the end. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not saying that the new sex education was eons better oh yes and i there are some people that are saying that i personally haven't taught it i don't teach sex education i only know what i have gleaned from the rage of my friends it needs to be something that you start young and build mm -hmm. like anything in education and you can't portray things accurately once just like what we we're talking about with misunderstanding being crucial it is you need to know what people think so that you can change that right. if need be. And if I've had 10 health classes in my life, all spread out over five, six, seven, eight, five years, when were my assumptions given room to be challenged? Yeah, that's fair. When you put the number on it to how few classes were actually dedicated to discussing sex. Mm -hmm. But that's the sex education curriculum that's in place right now. Nice. Do you think that what Vendla's mother was doing with like first you start out with the stork yeah and you start out with oh it's when a husband and wife love each other that's how you make a baby do you think it's like too slow to progress like do you think um no I just don't think that fiction should be involved at any point mm. there's a lot of trust that has to exist from both sides and I think that it's fine to say let's talk about this when you're older. There shouldn't really be a problem with that. Saying, I'm glad you're interested and we're gonna have this conversation in a little bit, but right now is not the time. And 
yeah, the, the kid has got to trust you. You've got to trust the kid. Maybe they'll find it out on their own. But if they're asking in-depth questions, obviously tell them what's going on. But at no point should you be like, a stork comes with a baby. <laughs> it's just there now. And I know that it was, it was convention for a long time. And I think that that comes from people's discomfort with talking about this with children and with talking about it in a graduated, responsible way. I think that it's difficult for parents not to feel like it is just one conversation. More and more with the consent culture that's building up around us, it becomes several conversations, you know? You don't have to hug grandma if you don't want to because you're allowed to choose what happens to your body right. at three years old. I don't know, I feel crazy when I talk about this because for my generation at the very least, it was one conversation. Yeah. It was a, this is what happens, this is how it is. Do you have any questions? Great, bye. Yeah. All of the characters in this book would have been improved greatly with either parents willing to have that conversation or a system, an education system willing to improve that problem. But I don't think it would be entirely solved without both. Right. What do we want to pull away from this? Like, what do we think ultimately does the sexual experience, experience, right? Like, what does their curious encounter in the woods, by the river? Whatever that was. Like, how do we come away from that? Because I feel like it happens in a song. Like, the actual sex happens in between a song that sounds like church music to me. Yeah. And it's something about a wound. So it seems very loving. Yeah. It's a refrain of the the beating song. Melchior is asked to beat Wenda, Wendel... Vendela? Vendela. Why? Why can't I name? Uh. <laughs> Melchior... Or what, Vendela asks Melchior to beat her with a switch. Yeah, after she's... finding out about the sexual abuse of her friend. Yeah. And so they sing the, oh, I'm gonna be wounded, oh, I'm gonna be your wound song there. But then I think it has a refrain no, together. No, that's is, I believe. Yeah, the one that has like that high note that was supposed to coincide with the climax. The big moment. Yes. But like it actually, if you read the sex scene, it sounds pretty loving. Yeah. I definitely read it that way. And I was surprised to find that it had been an assault. In the original play. Yeah. So at one point, Melchior... Mel... Mel... Why am I, so, why am I putting the I in the wrong place? I believe... Melchi- Melchior. Thank you. Reaches inside Vendela's undergarments and strokes her gently. Those are the stage directions. And so Vendela says, now there, now that's... And he goes, yes? And she goes, yes. So it goes from a question to being like, yes. Like, that is a good feeling. That is a good touch. Melchior... Did I do it? Melchior, you did it. Takes his pants off. The people are singing, I believe. (laughs) (laughs) Believe in what? (laughs) I don't know. And then he penetrates her. It seems like pretty loving, pretty pretty consensual. Like, is this okay? Does this feel good? It does seem very consensual. Yes, it feels good. And then afterwards, it's like, are you all right? Was that okay? How are you feeling? It seems like a really consensual scene. For two people who don't know what they're doing. And some part of me, when I read this originally, before I knew about what it was in the play, was thinking about the fundamental innocence that they both had and the way they approached it very innocently, which maybe is not a bad thing. I don't mean innocent in the way that they don't know about it. Yeah. I mean innocent in the way that they don't know what it fully entails, they're figuring it out together, and they both seem to respect each other enough to negotiate it, which uh, gives me hope (laughs) that if you're that uneducated, you can still treat people respectfully Mm -hmm. in that context. I do think that it's more of the time that it happened in the play the way that it did. I feel like it's also interesting that they're not in a relationship. Yeah. Like, they're not boyfriend and girlfriend. They don't court or whatever. Well, that wasn't really how it happened in that time either, right? Mm. Boyfriend and girlfriend, that's a very modern. modern. That's like post-50s. In the 50s, you'd be going steady. In the 19th century, would they not be courting at least? Well, okay. Like, arrange social interactions? So the thing that we, I think, the, the context here that I found important is that teenagers did not exist until this past century. Right. You were a child and then you were an adult. And so part of the difficulty with parents communicating with their kids is that they still think of them as kids. There isn't that intermediary stage Mm -hmm. where you go from being 10 
to being 18. Somewhere in the middle, you become a man, you become a woman. And that's why so many cultures have a uh, bat mitzvah or a quinceanera, because there's that acknowledgement that the teenage aspect of this wasn't a thing. Of course you don't have boyfriend, girlfriends. You become a man and then you find a wife. Right. Neither of them are adults. And so neither of them are on the market. Right. This is very far removed from what the social norm should have been in the minds of their parents. And I think that's why their reaction to it, though it seems really extreme to us now, would seem appropriate in the time period. If you're like trying to think of this from their perspective, if your child made another child pregnant before they were even thinking about finding a wife, dating, before they even should have known about those things, it's shocking and it's horrifying. Right. Even though at the age that they're at, they're what, like 15, 14, 16? They're teens. For some reason, I'm thinking that the boys are 14. Okay, yeah, I think 14 is the number that I saw. But 14 is an age where you could have been married much longer ago. (laughs) A very long while ago. And 14 is an age that you could have been married maybe in that society after certain expectations are met, right? They're passing exams. Melchior is clearly going through some sort of academic thing. Vendla doesn't know about this yet, which means that her parents, her mom especially, must not have deemed her an adult woman yet. There's something that they're waiting for. There's some sort of trial she must pass through. And I think that to accept this work, you have to understand that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you really can only understand it through the contemporary frame. Yeah. Of these are teens having wild teen sex, having a teen time. So enjoying the musical as much as you do, would you be interested in reading the original play? Yeah, I would. What do you think would be the interest in that comparison? Like, do you want to consume something that is just in a different format? Or what are you expecting to change? And what do you hope will change and not change? Because the songs are all standing in for the place of the monologues that exist in the play, I would be interested in seeing sort of the original context and ideas. Because I think in translating the songs, in updating the songs, it probably changed the impact. I'm wondering... And this is something that I should have checked out before now, but I'm checking out now. Is it originally in English? No. So this is... It's translated and modernized. Wow. Okay. I wonder, and obviously I will never read an untranslated version, but I wonder how different this is in another language. That is a super interesting question, especially because of how Europe seems to treat sex. Mm -hmm. America, by extension Canada, because we've consumed a lot of the same media, heavily censors sex, whereas Europe censors violence. I think just in watching something like uh, Die der Welt, which is a queer love story, there's a lot of penises. Hmm. And like, the implication, I'm not sure if it's a real erect penis or a dildo. You see uh, an erect penis being stimulated in a shower with two teenage looking actors. This is a film? It's a film. And like it was marketed to teens. Like if you look at their Instagram page, like the people responding right. are Our young. Teens. So I'm curious if the reception of that work even now yep. would be different in the original language. That makes sense to me. I mean, I think the big American teen movie that I would compare it to would be like The Fault in Our Stars, which in the movie is pretty sanitized. I guess what I'm most interested to find out is how strong the language is surrounding different things. Mm. In that, to me, there are shades of gray here in how strongly the mother is shutting down Vendla asking questions. To me, there is something interesting in the way these people communicate to each other because at its core, this is about miscommunication. Yeah. I don't know. The idea of hearing that in its original text, I think is more interesting than many translations later parsing what is almost a different work. I mean, it is a different work. Yeah. Almost entirely a different work. It's based on the same basic story, but they've changed enough of it that I don't think it's, I don't think it can be analyzed the same way. Would you read the original work? I would. I would actually If left to my own devices, if this podcast didn't exist, alternate universe would have been more likely to read the play. The the reason I heard about this is the television show Rise picked this as sort of the focal point to center the narrative of their one season before they got (laughs) cancelled. 
Um, <laughs> that was the only way, like reason I'd heard about this. You know how teen stuff usually has like whatever the kid is watching or reading mirrored in their life? Yep. The show yeah. did the same thing. So I'd be curious if that hadn't gotten canned, how they would have continued to play with this narrative. Yeah. I would love to see here read a version of this in which Venla is the person with knowledge and Melchior doesn't know what's going on. If it's set in a modern yeah. sort of template, what's to stop her from doing a whole bunch of Google searching? Would you have to age them down significantly? Like, could you buy that a 13-year-old Venla would have knowledge yeah. that a 13-year-old oh, yeah. boy wouldn't? Oh, <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, in certain circumstances, right? I mean, we're speaking generally, but a very precocious young lady and a somewhat sheltered young man. Yeah, I could see that. It's more the context of the assorted teens that would kind of change that up. I also think it would be interesting from the perspective of, uh, obviously, these young ladies have menstruated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have had to have been told something. Or were they? That's another element of this, but what if they had that conversation when that started happening? And the boys are just totally oblivious, living their normal childhood lives. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it wouldn't take some reworking, but a version of this, either gender swapped or just something like that. There's something interesting to be said. Yeah. That's all I got. Yeah. Is it just going to be my suggestion at the end of every podcast? Just and be like, what if you gender swapped it? it? <laughs> what if you just... Yeah, what if they were gay? It's I, always an I need it on a t-shirt. What if they were gay? Yes. <laughs> With an exclamation point, too. Yes. That's, what if they were gay? Whoa. Here we go, future merch. <laughs> <laughs> this was good. I'm glad that I got out of my bubble, and I did a different thing. You should see her face right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I had to do it. This is the thing. I did not have an option because I made you listen to an opera. But I enjoyed the opera. That's because opera is good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. Wild Sound Civilized is recorded on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabewake and Attawandaronk peoples. Transcripts are available on our website. Our intro music is Fantasia in D minor by Georg Philip Telemann, performed by Bigley Duff. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Wild Sound Civilized with a Z. You can email us at Wild Sound Civilized Podcast at gmail.com. And if you liked what you heard here today, you can support us on patreon.com slash Wild Sound Civilized.